Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar event uh, hosted by the uh, program on U.S. global engagement at the uh, Carnegie Council for Ethics and in International Affairs. This is part of an ongoing conversation that the uh, U.S. Global Engagement Program has been having really for the last three years on narratives uh, for American foreign policy, rationales for U.S. global engagement. Uh, and the genesis of this particular event on human security is actually an outgrowth uh, of our event a few weeks ago, uh, the Vox Populi event, which uh, hopefully some of you had attended or uh, in seeing the invitation for this event with Derek Reveron saw the link back to that event. Uh, that event, the Vox Populi event, was an attempt to try to capture a moment in time in U.S. public opinion. What are Americans saying about the importance of foreign policy and national security? And one of the outgrowths of that event was that while Americans may be less interested or concerned about questions about the balance of power in the South China Sea or questions about uh, credibility in international affairs. The concept of human security is very much uh, falls along the line of what, uh, in a previous event, uh, Asha uh, Castleberry Hernandez would have referred to as a doorstep issue. Uh, that people may be less concerned about alliance relationships, but they are concerned about uh, pandemics. They are concerned about globalization. They are concerned about how events that happen in other parts of the world may impact them on their, on their doorsteps. And so based on that event, uh, particularly from the Q&A and the discussion that we were having, I felt it was important for us to revisit this question of, of human security and how it plays out uh, with questions of national security and global engagement. And so I'm really pleased to have my friend and colleague, Dr. Derek Reveron, with us today, because Derek has been one of the pioneers in, the, in developing and, in, and, and uh, exploring this concept of human security, um, taking national security uh, away from perhaps just the grand strategic level and bringing it down to uh, the actual human being uh, the, the needs and uh, interests of the human being, and, and again, how these global developments can impact the individual, whether it be exposure to disease, whether it be um, cyber issues, and how what we do online and our lives online have an impact uh, or, or intersect with these trends and, and with these developments. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, post into the chat momentarily, uh, not only Derek's biography, which was sent out to you, uh, but also Derek and uh, Kathleen uh, Mahoney Norris uh, essentially wrote the book on human security, uh, gathering together the thinkers and some of the, the, the issues there. And, and Derek, I don't know if you have a copy of the book uh, handy, if you can show it. Uh, and uh, Rutledge, the publisher, has made uh, a chapter of that book available. Uh, and so I'm also going to go ahead in, in a moment and post the link uh, to the chapter for those people who would like to be able to, uh, uh, to have that a, as a resource. Um, Derek is uh, the uh, chairman of the National Security Affairs Department at the U.S. Naval War College. He's a faculty affiliate uh, at the Belfer Center at Harvard University, uh, someone who is, as I said, has spearheaded uh, this discussion of human security and linking it to, to national security. Uh, he's going to speak, uh, as he always does on these issues, in his personal capacity. He's not here in any uh, official capacity, and, and his remarks uh, and comments uh, do not reflect any official position of the U.S. Naval War College uh, or of the Department of Defense. Uh, so with that, Derek, let me turn the floor over to you. Uh, Take us through what you'd like to uh, in, in exploring these issues of human security. We will be uh, keeping a, a close eye on the chat. So if you are uh, on, the, uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the call and you can use the chat function to uh, enter in questions and comments, they will be curated. My colleague, uh, uh, Billy Pickett, will then be uh, uh, referring those questions to Derek uh, and those comments to Derek to get his uh, feedback. 
And in that way, we hope to have a, a very robust discussion. So with that, Derek, the floor is yours. Okay, hey, great. Thank you, Nick, uh, for having me and the Carnegie Council for arranging this event. Uh, what a great way to spend a lunch hour on a hot summer day here in July. And I appreciate everything the council does and, and having these discussions. I mean, it's hard to imagine that this is allegedly an election year and we'll see a, an election for the US presidency, uh, I think in about a hundred days or so. Uh, but of course, all eyes and ears and energy is focused on really crushing the pandemic, crushing COVID. Uh, and so we haven't really moved into campaign season, I think fully, but that'll certainly change, I think probably, um, you know, early September, maybe we'll get back into that mode. Um, I do, you know, again, want to acknowledge and I appreciate, um, you know, the shout out for the book, um, you know, my colleague, Kathleen Mahoney Norris, I did invite her. Um, she retired a few years ago uh, and uh, has other, you know, other obligations in retirement, uh, but uh, she sends her best and uh, thanks for giving us this opportunity to share the ideas. Um, you know, a couple of things, um, you know, that I'll, I'll sort of highlight and, and whether you want to sort of, um, you know, be direction uh, through questions. Um, you know, first, it's a, the second edition of a book. Uh, and so as we started thinking about this, probably started thinking about this in the early 90s, you know, I would say, and there are a lot of other good books out on human security uh, as well. I think it became a focus for us in about 2008, 2009, and a number of issues sort of were, you know, were coming to a head that made us really think about what should be the object of national security. Uh, and, you know, about 10 years ago, you know, we were very much focused on uh, concerns about climate change. Um, there was also at the time, uh, if you remember the Gripe Porcina, because I see we have somebody from Chile uh, on the line. So that was H5N1, the influenza back then, as well as you can go a few years before that, SARS. Um, so if we wanted to stay in that pandemic realm, but also other, you know, other important issues um, uh, in the maritime security space, overfishing, you know, for example, and, you know, small skirmishes related to countries sending fishing fleets out into other countries' waters and, and harvesting. Uh, and we're also deeply concerned, you know, with human migration and human rights and how those factor. And I like how you sort of framed it, uh, or a previous guest framed it as a human security is a doorstep issue. One of the things I'll, you know, I'll admit up front, we, we struggled a little bit with how do we conceptualize this and how do we package everything? So the first edition, we simply called um, these as threats without borders. And the second one, we wanted to be a little more explicit. And I think if we could figure out a way to just not say human or national, but, but really just talk security, and it would mean something, we would probably do that. Uh, and you know, as, as we sort of look at both, and, and I think that's typical to divide on the academic side as well, you know, human security issues are seen as sort of a soft developmental issues, um, not terribly relevant in a developed country like the United States, um, though we'll get to why it is. And I think it's too visible, you know, today, you know, in, in negative ways, you know, certainly I think in the past, because the US um, and uh, European, Japanese and other governments have had always very active public health campaigns, but often addressing sort of public health concerns was done as a foreign policy, you know, promoting vaccination around the world. Um, not necessarily, you know, inside the borders of say Germany or the United States, because that's sort of done as, you know, more of a matter of routine, but as a foreign policy, vaccination is foreign policy. Um, clear, right, it's clearly visible now why public health is important and we're seeing the shortcomings inside the United States. Uh, because of COVID-19. Um, also questions of identity. Um, and, and again, I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, both Kathleen and I came from a, a, um, a military intelligence background and we spent sort of our time in training, studying really Soviet weapons, radars, thinking about Cold War large conventional fights, but then our military careers were very different in terms of the kind of issues. And so we, we both started to bring in this question how do we explain US foreign policy? How do we explain US military deployments? Does traditional concepts of national security help us do that? Our answer was largely no. Um, when we started looking at conflicts, for example, uh, in the 1990s, you know, 30 years ago now, uh, in the Balkans, you know, it was characterized as ethnic war, 
And Nick, as you know, you know there was a, a great uh, uh, divergence between sort of European thinking on intervening in Bosnia and then Kosovo, uh, and then the US really coming into it late. Um, but this notion, you know, at the time was uh, superpowers don't do windows, you know, in the case for the United States. And so that, you know, human security is, is, is something we do because we're all human beings on this planet. Um, we believe, you know, the United States believes deeply in human rights uh, and we should do our part, but we shouldn't use the military to sort of support that. And in some other work that I've done, you know, I think my, you know, my little thing is, uh, you know, militaries do more than fight wars and, uh, and this is true, you know, if you, if you stop and think about how many militaries or governments today actually think about fighting a war with another country, I think it's a real handful. Um, and, and, you know, the other 180 countries in the world, they think about sort of national security, I think, in a more holistic way. So both Kathleen and I saw sort of a gap in terms of U.S. strategic thinking, in terms of how we approach that. So we started rethinking things, you know, a bit. And, and so even in the case of Vietnam, it was certainly cast the Vietnam War, um, in the 60s, it was you know, recast as sort of an ideological struggle. Um, but you know, looking at it from a Vietnamese perspective, it was really about identity and it was an anti-colonial war um, and really solidifying their identity. Um, and in the Balkans, the, you know, the ethnic conflict, um, again, it was very much identity that as Yugoslavia fragmented, uh, peoples were forced to identify with their base ethnic group. And then when groups didn't quite fit, like those, you know, predominantly uh, Muslim living in Bosnia, uh, you know, had to sort of create this identity or revive this identity of being a Bosniak. Um, and and, that, and this, you know, of course, became a source of conflict. Um, and then, you know, probably in the 2010s, you know, an example about uh, economic insecurity um, that has produced, you know, mass human migration, you know, throughout the Middle East and, and North Africa into Europe. And again, a traditional notion of national security didn't really help us and so we started to sort of look at this question um, of what explains this? You know, what are these underlying causes? I guess is probably the way that we wanted to get after this. And that's where we, we felt great appeal to this concept of human security. Um, if we think, you know, more broadly sort of, the, you know, in the, in the book title, we say human and national, um, you know, the, what is the link then between say, um, you know, ethnic identity or, or economic insecurity or climate change, pandemic to national security. Um, one of the things that we, you know, again, sort of notice and, and feel is, you know, that I think the bias in national security circles establishment thinking tends to be sort of defining sort of the most dangerous as a nuclear war with another great power. Um, and, and then that sort of leads to sort of the, you know, from an acquisition perspective, the bias towards the most expensive solution. And so, you know, a simple question like, well, what's better than a fourth generation fighter, right? A fifth generation fighter. And so we keep having these incremental improvements in terms of how we build out our defense establishments. And, and then when you see though, how defense is applied, you know, as a tool of foreign policy, you often see sort of a mismatch. You know, so for example, the United States and its allies and partners have been in Afghanistan now uh, coming up on uh, 20 years. Um, and you look at sort of the very expensive militaries designed for conventional conflict, you know, haven't really produced the results that people would expect, namely defeat the Taliban, you know, let alone bring stability, which is a you know, different sort of problem. But as we sort of started looking at, like in the question of Afghanistan, and, and I served there for a year, um, you know, the solutions weren't really traditional military conventional solutions. It was about, you know, the programs were about how do you improve Afghan literacy? How do you improve Afghan public health? How do you promote inclusivity and diversity? Um, key things to bring stability to a society because Kathleen and I really conclude without human security, you can't have national security. And the lack of security inside Afghanistan brought together dozens of countries in an attempt to, to stabilize it. At the same time, it brought in groups, both um, uh, domestic Taliban, um, you know, or foreign, you know, different versions of, you know, at the time, either Al Qaeda or, or now ISIS, um, you know, attempting to sort of uh, uh, harness that, that instability for their own purposes. Uh, and, and so we sort of looked at, um, you know, to, to give the COVID plug, the, right, so our bias is towards the most expensive. Uh, and so, you know, the most expensive meant, 
you know, doing the gene sequencing of COVID-19, um, you know, virus in about three hours, and there's dozens of countries developing a vaccine, the cheap solution might be the mask. You know, it's a highly cheap solution, but, um, you know, we're all counting on the vaccine, but, you know, in the, in the short term, right, the mask is, is the other way to sort of get at it. Um, because there was no gene sequencing, you know, when the references are made back to the 1918 influenza. Germ theory, I think, was very, you know, barely a, an idea 100 years ago during the last great influenza pandemic, let alone gene sequencing and, and DNA. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, one of the concerns, too, that we had is at times our sort of traditional national security lens overshadows these human security issues. And so, you know, if we take the case of China, you know, the U.S. has identified China as a competitor um, and the U.S. is deeply concerned about expansive Chinese claims uh, in the maritime space, um, Chinese military modernization, um, you know, to include deliberately developing, um, you know, systems to, you know, target the U.S., its forces, its allies uh, in the region. Um, so there's a lot of attention on China from a national security perspective, very little attention about public health in China. And as we sort of think about, right, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives have been lost, millions infected, probably millions will die, um, trillions of dollars on the economy globally, um, contraction of GDP, and it's going to have lasting impact. But very little, I would say, national attention is focused on that. And that, again, is sort of one of, I think, the diagnoses we have is, at least in the United States, the national government is, you know, thinks really external. Um, and, you know, state governments are responsible for public health and education um, and, uh, you know, things of, that we would put in the human security uh, field. But we can see sort of the limits of states having their various COVID-19 responses that we can't get a national solution uh, because of that fragmentation. Um, and in certain fields, um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll offer sort of one more last thought and then we can, you know, you can, you can interrogate my my thesis here um, is, you know, this idea too of human security, the other point I always like to make um, is, you know, it's, it's very much, it, it's an American idea um, that, and, and I'll at least reach back to um, uh, FDR's 1941 uh, State of the Union address. And so, you know, the US president really laying out these four freedoms, um, you know, that people everywhere in the world, regardless of location, regardless of nationality, um, should have freedom of speech. They should have freedom of worship. They should have freedom from want. Um, and they should have freedom from fear. And these four freedoms, I think, are really inside the, the DNA of U.S. national security thinking. Um, I, you know, a longer discussion of, you know, how we got, how that fell out, um, you know, I would pull you into that discussion because you think a lot about this as well. You know, some of it, I think, is the nuclear age um, that we got into, right, the, the bias towards humanity could end in 12 minutes with a nuclear war. And, and so these issues were sort of deemed as lesser. Um, I would say probably advances within developed countries in public health um, uh, and uh, in vaccinations and eliminating that and sort of that global campaign. Um, you know, poverty, you know, there, there were obviously, you know, in the 60s, there was sort of a conservative effort, the war on poverty, you know, to address that. That still sort of continues both in the U.S. and globally. Um, and, and we've often sort of, you know, fragmented, I think, these two dimensions. And, and, you know, as I said earlier, we would sort of default to you can't have national security without human security. Uh, and uh, but, you know, that, that's sort of the big overview. You know, the book is, you know, we, we try to do a lot because it's a very, um, you know, if you look at sort of United Nations definitions on human security and their various efforts over time to uh, highlight each component of it. It's a very comprehensive uh, idea. Um, and so there's a lot of things and, and we really just tried to lay out, I think some of the basic, you know, the basic issues. And even I felt a little good, uh, better about looking at the health security chapter again, which as you, as you noted is, you know, the, the publisher put it up online given COVID. Um, you know, the key point we try to make is look, disease knows no boundaries. And so as we think through national security, which is very much bounded in this concept of sovereignty, um, things, things like health don't matter. Climate change doesn't care whether you're American, Canadian, you know, or Chilean. Um, it impacts everybody globally. And so, you know, if there's any sort of message, I guess, that, you know, we would have is, 
you know, international cooperation, you know, is very much essential to this. Uh, no single country can solve any of these sort of problems that we lay out. Certain countries can exacerbate the problems. Um, and, uh, and, and so as we sort of look into the future from a foreign policy perspective, we're gonna have to very much figure out how do we manage um, you know, competing with China in some places um, and partnering in others. Um, and, uh, and that's not an easy thing to do. And, and so the policymakers who attempt to do that, uh, you know, there's a lot of ambiguity out there, um, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll kind of, uh, you know, as the president likes to say, we'll, we'll see what happens. Let me just uh, unmute myself there for a moment and I'll take the uh, moderator's prerogative of uh, perhaps summarizing and, and, uh, and pushing you in a few areas and throwing out some ideas for, for further discussion. And I have also see that uh, uh, robust discussion in the chat. So we'll also be uh, bringing all of that in as well. But uh, Derek, as you were talking, one of the things is, listening, there was a point where you said, you know, look, we have climate change exacerbating economic issues in countries. We have migration. We now have a pandemic uh, in place. And listening to that, I can see where you can have two very different approaches uh, that you can try to, to sell to a domestic population as to how you're going to solve. One is, you can push for greater cooperation, which is to say, and as you ended, right, no one country can solve these things. We have to work together. Uh, we're all going to be facing these impacts. Uh, but on the other hand, we have this kind of populist decoupling response, which says, uh, yes, we're going to face these problems, but uh, we should decouple from the rest. We should uh, fortress, you know, pull within our fortress walls, try to deal with it ourselves cut other people off. It's a zero-sum uh, world. If, if, if someone else succeeds, we fail, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So I, I do see that I think this is interesting that uh, you know, both kind of internationalists, if I can use that term, I don't, I don't want to use globalists because now it has more of a, a negative connotation, but the internationalists say, look, we come together, we work together for a common solution, but then there's a populist uh, response to human security, which says, take care of our own and let everyone else go. And I think what we just saw yesterday with the European Union uh, really splitting the difference uh, on how they're going to deal with the economic response to the pandemic, which was uh, the frugal four saying this has to be on the basis of loans, the Italians and the Portuguese and the Spanish saying these should be grants, uh, European solidarity and really splitting the difference between some grants and some loans, uh, kind of a combination of this internationalist and, and, and populist uh, approach. And then it also, I think, raises an, an ethic, ethical questions. And of course, we are the, the Carnegie Council uh, for Ethics in International Affairs. And just listening uh, to, as we're dealing with the pandemic that, you know, the, a very stark ethical choice, which is we can work with China on finding a, a, a quick vaccine and, and really moving forward. But if the Chinese government says the price for our cooperation uh, in you know, making a vaccine available and working with you on it is you have to turn a blind eye to Hong Kong, to, to the Uyghurs, uh, and then we, we kind of have a, a who's, who's human security uh, takes precedence. Is there a global human security for fighting COVID, or does that mean then that you know, within China itself, uh, different groups of people lose a degree of human security um, in terms of their rights? As you said, and you cited the four freedoms: that um, you know, freedom to worship, freedom to speak for Hong Kong for Uyghurs is subordinated necessarily to. Uh, you know, human security of making sure that uh, we deal with with this pandemic. So, not that there's an answer to that, but really, you know, the the ethical trade-offs that we may have to consider, as with climate change, as with other things, of uh, winners, losers, uh, whose rights, whose preferences, I think, are something that uh, are going to be uh, issues that we're facing. And then, of course, 
this brings us as you as you opened your remarks to say we're in an election year, uh, and this suddenly becomes a matter of domestic politics because a, a second term Trump administration is going to have a very different approach to human security uh, and and these these questions than a first term uh, Joe Biden administration. So with that, more I guess just. Some comments. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think you, you you summarize sort of the dilemma that you know um, real policymakers face is, is how do you you know how do you balance that? I mean, I always use sort of that hypothetical, you know, um, you know, you, you're you're trying to sit down and develop a a summit uh, between the U.S. president and the Chinese president, and and you know the U.S. would make its list of issues, the Chinese would make its list of issues, and then you'd figure out what overlaps so you could actually get together and talk about. Um, and, and this is sort of, I think, what the, you know, the, the decision-making space today, you know, is, is very different. Um, you know, you, you and I don't use the Cold, Cold War analogy to today, though, you know, others do. Um, you know, they're, they're, the, key, the key difference, right, I, I would say, is there, there was uh, no ambiguity, um, you know, during Cold War versus today, you know, where in some places, you know, China, China is a partner, you know, on the question of, you know, in it, kind of the question of North Korea. So this goes back to sort of the, you know, like, what do you, what do you bias? So if you're primarily focused on uh, North Korea's nuclear program, China is an essential partner. Um, all right, full stop. Um, and, and then you're able to, as, as, you know, this administration, and, and then if we go back to, um, you know, during the Obama administration, um, you know, the number one concern at the time, I think, with China was really, you know, China buying U.S. debt, um, Chinese investment in the United States, uh, trade with China. And so we sort of um, didn't necessarily raise the questions of South China Sea um, and island reclamation. Um, we didn't really, you know, we, we had a bit of a, um, you know, a slowdown in intellectual property theft, uh, you know, that was developed between President Obama and Xi. Um, but you have to, right, you have to prioritize and you have to rank and saying, well, what is, what is the most important thing? And, and this is sort of the challenge for policymakers everywhere. Um, you know, the, the, you know, but I would say it, it's kind of, I, I think what this sort of the human security forces us to think about is what matters more. And, and then what's your timeline? Um, you know, uh, and, and so, because human security forces sort of a very people centric view. So Americans should care what happens to freedoms in Hong Kong or uh, the Uyghurs, um, you know, or, um, you know, even uh, in Eastern Ukraine. Um, and, um, and so that, you know, that should matter. Um, but the current international system, which the US largely benefits from, um, that might be changing. So, so maybe this is sort of that window is uh, that, you know, human security says it, it's about, right? It's it sort of, in my mind, it sort of shifts. Like what, what lens are you looking at it, things? Are you looking at problems through a sovereignty lens um, or are you looking at problems through sort of a human lens? And while it's tempting to see, you know, the pitfalls of globalization, you know, today, and countries are, are, are reacting. And so, you know, j just like the US has been trying to reshore manufacturing in the United States, even before COVID-19, um, China has a made in 2025 uh, program that they want to create really domestic uh, IT information technology companies in China, because they're skeptical. So, and, you know, countries will always sort of favor, right? They're, they're, you want the benefits of globalization without the costs. COVID-19 sort of puts all that in stark contrast because if really people movement is you know, effectively stopped um, and there is an effort to revive domestic industry, uh, that'll probably be tempting. Um, but you, you know, I'd highlight um, you know, the, you know, historically, again, the, the 1918 um, influenza that moved around the world without air travel. Um, and so maybe it would just be a little slower. Um, or you look at a case of climate change. Borders do not matter with climate change. So it sort of forces that, I think, that cooperation. Um, but, you know, you can't discount, you know, I mean, the other sort of critique, and, and I would, since you highlighted my book, I mean, I would highlighted your book, um, that, you know, we, we can't, right, the people that study foreign policy tend to only just want to look at threats. And, and they don't consider with inside someone's borders within the government, 
how that government operates in that interaction between what it thinks is a threat or not and what its people demand and how it, how it goes about dealing with those sort of issues. So it's very, you know, it's very interactive uh, in, in terms of, you know, what it'll be, um, um, you know, the sense of, um, you know, with, if, if President Trump is reelected, you know, uh, it, what, what it'll probably mean, I think, probably for countries around the world is, is they'll look for alternative solutions, you know, than the United States um, and, and maybe regionalize. But, you know, it, it's, um, it, it's a tough world right now, too. I mean, this is always one of those amazing things about the United States is, you know, we're, we appear to be a very rich country. Um, I, I think we just have very good credit. Um, and, and the U.S., for whatever reason, the capital markets and the debt markets have no uh, hesitation to, to loan money to the U.S. government and, and to U.S. corporations and states. And, and we're able to finance what, you know, what we finance. So it's unclear, like, if you cut it off, what that would look like. Um, maybe the last point, too, I would, I would say, too, because we sometimes forget about um, you know, this, is, um, and, and I think this is true whether Trump is reelected or Biden, and, and it might differ by region. But there, there doesn't seem to be a shortage. So I think the complaint today is, is the U.S. is absent. Um, and, and so countries have agency, too. And, and so, you know, as, as we think about sort of NATO expansion, you know, it's at 30, as you know. Uh, and sometimes that sort of pit is, you know, it's U.S. imperialism, knocking on Russian borders. Well, we forget those countries that have joined, you know, now it's, you know, since 1999, that, that NATO expansion. So again, that's 21 years, you know, Poland chose to join NATO. Um, and, and we get into the early 2000s, uh, I think 2004, you know, the Baltic countries chose to join NATO. And, and so I think the U.S. has to think about, you know, those things. It's just not about us, but it's, it's, it's about how the other countries want to behave and incorporate the United States uh, into its foreign policy. I think all critical points that you've raised there. And again, this point about agency, I think that people are, uh, is important, both agency of governments, but also agency of people and voters in the choices that they make. Uh, that uh, when they cast ballots, uh, whether in the United States, uh, in Europe, in Latin America, uh, in Asia for governments, they are, you know, casting for the, for people to make these choices and to make these priorities for them. Uh, let me turn the floor over, if I can, then to, uh, uh, to Billy Pickett, who has been uh, monitoring the, uh, uh, the questions and comments coming in. And uh, uh, Billy, if I can ask you to, I think, I, as I have been seeing it, uh, a steady stream of things coming in. So I think we've got uh, more than enough for, uh, uh, Derek to, to chew on without me having to uh, to continue. So uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Derek. Um, our first few questions come from Carnegie Council President Joel Rosenthal. He asks, do analysts still think in terms of kinetic and non-kinetic threats and responses? Can the Department of Defense shift emphasis from planes, ships, tanks, and missiles to public health, cyber defense, and climate security? Can there be a narrative shift inside the defense establishment? Um, I think right now the answer is no, um, you know, in terms of the narrative shift. I mean, the, the dominant narrative is great power um, competition. And, and the U.S., uh, you know, explicitly when H.R. Um, McMaster was national security advisor um, and uh, uh, Jim Mattis was secretary of defense, really sort of formulated, you know, this, this new thinking of, you know, you know, we say GPC, great power competition lens, that terrorism doesn't matter anymore. And I would probably broaden to right, civil war. There's a lot of conflict in the world. Most of it's internal. Um, and, you know, that doesn't matter as much anymore. It's about, you know, preparing, you know, to, um, you know, uh, deterring China, deterring Russia. And so a lot of heavy investment in new weapon systems. Um, and, you know, you saw, and this kind of goes along with, you know, the, the administration withdrawing, say, from the Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile Treaty. Um, uh, you know, I think within DOD, they're, they're, they were welcomed it because they feel outgunned in the, in the Pacific. Um, and, you know, there's a new class of missiles that will be deployed. Um, so not very, right, not very, uh, you know, if you, you know for, I think from a U.S. perspective, it's looking at it strengthening the deterrence, uh, strength, you know, peace through strength. 
uh, is the argument. But we also know by studying war miscalculation, um, right, is is, uh, is 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 an important cause of war. Uh, and by increasing sort of the strength, uh, you know, missile capability in in the Western Pacific, uh, you know, that that can lead to uh, miscalculations. You know, same thing with Europe. Um, Kinetic, non-kinetic, yeah, I, st I still hear it. I mean, I think that the new buzzword is, is you'll hate this one because you don't even have an opposite, is lethality. Um, and so there's a prime emphasis on making the US defense uh, uh, in the military just more lethal. And uh, so at least you, there was sort of that exploring. Um, on the plus side though, I wanna give a shout out uh, because I think um, you'll see, I think in fall in the, in the issue of Orbis, we, uh, a colleague and I wrote a book called Digital Human Security, and, and we wanted to sort of shift thinking on cybersecurity from sort of a sovereignty violation to really, you know, undermining um, uh, civil liberties, undermining privacy, you know, at the user level, at the individual level. And, and one of the, one of, in, in this article, we highlight the role that NSA and Cybercom now, they have been reaching out to U.S. business and U.S. Uh, individuals in, in releasing vulnerabilities. So people patch and, and the uh, Cybercom and NSA now have a Twitter, uh, official Twitter accounts, um, which I think with NSA, it's the one that came relatively new, like in the last few months. And so there is a greater outreach, uh, you know, along those lines. So I think there are, there, there are parts, you know, that deal with it. Uh, but, uh, you know, in, in general, I think there's, you know, the lens right now that, that sort of the, the U.S. has you know, beginning with, um, you know, the Trump administration. Um, though I would say Hillary Clinton, you know, talked to, you know, the pivot to the Pacific and, and really focusing on China's rise. And it just, I think, became enshrined through this great power competition uh, with uh, Secretary Mattis and uh, National Security Advisor uh, McMaster. Um, could the, um, you know, the next administration, whether it's Trump two or Biden one, um, move away from that? I, I'm not optimistic. I mean, I don't see very much um, divergence anymore on thinking about China. I mean, there, there seems to be, there doesn't seem, you know, about 10 years ago, I mean, you, you could put people in two camps, sort of the panda hugger, um, you know, camp, responsible stakeholder camp, and then the dragon slayer, um, you know, sort of camp. I don't see those camps much anymore. I mean, I, and, uh, and, and that's unfortunate, uh, you know, I think, uh, but maybe it reflects the reality in terms of how people, at least how the U.S. is interpreting China, you know, I think in a very dismal negative way. Um. Great. Uh, our next question comes from George Paik. He asks, taking the creed of the Declaration of Independence of rights and government securing them as America's base of identity, might that explain U.S. policy reflexes? Could it push us toward individualism and U.S. sovereignty and away from collaboration? Does it partly explain populism? Conversely, might it push us toward addressing and intervening abroad on human rights issues? No, I mean, it's a great question. And, and I have really tried to, you know, at least in my own writing and thinking, um, is, is try to bring in U.S. culture into the discussion uh, for national security. And, and again, it's, it's, it's absent, largely. And, and I think, you know, if you want to understand why has you know the the U.S. Um, uh, you know have a a global program to combat disease? I don't think traditional national security can explain that. I mean, I think there is sort of a human culture side, you know, that explains these programs. Um, the you know it, it's sort of what American you know, but policymakers always has to answer that question. If we're building schools in Afghanistan, why aren't we building schools in the United States? Um, and, and that's a hard one, I think, sometimes for people. And, and usually they'll go on to, you know, the, the foreign aid budget in the U.S. is less than 1% of the budget. And it's, it's minuscule. It's tiny. Um, and I think people often don't know how big the United States is. And, and I usually always try to highlight it. It's, we're the third most populous country in the world. Um, by GDP, we're the largest economy. PPP, we're number two. Um, we're a very large country. And I love Colin Powell in his um, uh, confirmation hearing in 2001 to be Secretary of State, you know, said something to the effect, you know, the United States, we're, we're a country connected by a thousand cords around the world um, because it has been so welcoming to immigration. Um, and, uh, and so people have those interests, you know, that they voice uh, around the world. 
And then, you know, again, you could be more pragmatic about it and say, well, you know, uh, on the southern border, why, why are people willing to risk their lives to walk, um, you know, or be smuggled into the United States, you know, for the better life? And, and you really, I think, saw it in the 90s, you know, beginning with NAFTA and then sort of the, the reinvigoration of the trade treaty um, is, you know, you, you can bring stability by promoting trade and development, um, you know, around the world. And then people won't risk their lives to, to sort of migrate in, in the way they do. Uh, and so, you know, there's that dimension. Um, and then there's always, right, the disease, I mean, brings everything, right, to the fore. Um, that, you know, that's, that's the other reason, you know, why, why do you want to eliminate smallpox or polio around the world? So you don't get it. Uh, and, and so there is that dimension. And then, and then the important benefit is, you know, that helps that society as well. But yeah, no, it's great. I mean, I think it's, I think we need more discussion and thinking on how U.S. culture gets pulled into foreign policy and national security. Oftentimes we run a, you know, very rationalize it and look at threats and go address those threats. And, and we don't necessarily consider, well, how does it, um, you know, just how does it improve, right? How does it improve the world? Um, or is it sort of the right thing to do, you know, because part of that, so the downside of that, you know, since you raise a declaration, I'll bring in the constitution, you know, you're seeing the shortcomings of federalism. Um, you know, the fact that state governments, you know, are really the dominant form of government in our personal lives. And you're seeing the shortcoming of federalism as we address COVID-19, you know, that we don't have the ability to really have a national solution. Um, and uh, because it's a prerogative of state governments, you know, largely. Uh, without right, getting into, into deeper discussions on states' rights and, and how that works. Let me just, uh, if I can, two finger for a moment, uh, Derek, because uh, uh, just something that you said now and, and going back to something you said in, in response uh, to, to uh, Joel's questions as well, uh, you know, is this, is this, you know, the, the the test for a national security establishment coping with these human security issues is, I think, to be able to explain to people in some form, you know, how you have come to your priorities. So, for example, like right now, you, you know, you simply you gave a great set of, look, why do we spend money on disease eradication around the world? Uh, you could say some of it maybe because there's an altruistic strain running through uh, through the American uh, body politic, but that there's a practical reason that we don't want to get these diseases. And if we eliminate these diseases around the world, uh, then we are, we are lessening the risk uh, to ourselves. Uh, why do we sign trade agreements with other countries? The logic is, well, you know, you may lose in the short run, uh, certain sectors of society and the economy may lose, but in the long run, you are creating societies where people won't migrate to yours and where they'll be able to buy your, your goods and services in return. Um, but it does sound like the challenge then is coming up uh, with kind of this explanation rather than, well, we just do these things because national security and, and end of discussion. So, uh, uh, you know, and, but then also then the, again, the priorities, which is, you know, where do you cooperate? Where do you diverge? And I think this is also a challenge we're going to be facing, which is, um, you know, we have a tendency that when a country does not cooperate with us in one area, we like to burn down all of the bridges across the board. And we may not have that luxury moving forward. I mean, uh, we'll see how the the, the, the search for a vaccine for COVID-19 moves forward. But this isn't, as you pointed out in your, in your opening remarks, this isn't the only pandemic that we faced over the last 20 years. And there may be other pandemics uh, more deadly uh, in the future. I mean, thank God this, even though this is a, a particularly infectious pandemic, it does not have the, you know, the, the, the mortality rate that uh, in the past, we've had with uh, with other plagues and, and things, but that may change in the future, where we have to then work with another government uh, for a, a solution, even when that government does things which you know offend our values, or uh, more importantly, uh, may you know clash with our preferences in in other areas. And so, it does seem that this question of narrative then comes back, which is you have to be able to explain. Uh, perhaps not in the you know not just simply as a bumper sticker, but at least have that 
that narrative in place why we're doing the things that we're doing um, and that in some ways uh, we are ha we've had a narrative collapse where uh, we we are doing things and, and and citizens are looking and saying oh I'm not seeing a benefit from this uh, and therefore we should stop doing it so I just I throw that out there as as a point and I'll turn the floor back over to Billy. Uh, Our next question is from Hernan Billigren, who asks, is there room for civil society organizations to be more active in human security issues while searching for better actions to couple those with non-traditional, old-fashioned national security views? Yeah, no, I think absolutely. And, and I think some of, you know, I would, you know, the, the criticism of some of my work, it looks like I want to securitize everything and I want the US military to do everything. And I would say that's not true, um, you know, first. Um, I think civil society, philanthropy um, has a lot to do and does a lot in this space um, and uh, is incredibly important. You know, I think where governments come in is, is they bring a lot of capacity. And so I think civil society can highlight um, problem areas and they can sometimes bring, you know, the solutions, but they don't have the same resource level that governments have. Uh, and, and that's where I think that can, you know, come into play. And, and in the case, you know, if you look at from a, a delivery model perspective, I mean, it's, it's largely it's, it's non-governmental organizations, civil society that do the delivery around the world. Um, and in the U.S., I would say, you know, it's, it's just simply not as developed. You know, occasionally you see, you know, we have like a major failure that all of a sudden brings these to, to the fore. And, and maybe the last one was... Um, uh, in uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, after Hurricane Katrina in 2004 or five, you know, where there was a complete breakdown of government, government couldn't deliver. Um, and, and I think you're seeing, you know, similar things in certain parts of the country today as it relates to COVID-19, where, you know, government is there, is not there. Um, and, and that's where civil society and corporations, you know, largely step, you know, step in to fill the void. Um, but you're, you know, you start running against, you um, you know, the, the tendency is to, you know, someone raised the declaration, you know, you know, Americans have a fundamental distrust of government and, and really want to defer to the private sector. So whether that's civil society, NGOs or business and the government, you know, uh, regulate certainly. But if we take, you know, one of the issues we explore in the book, which probably seemed a little odd from a human security perspective, I think it's making more sense to me now, but, but we included cybersecurity, information security uh, in the book. And, and at the time, it didn't completely make sense because everybody was sort of focused on cyber attacks against infrastructure, shutting down electricity, shutting down banking. Um, no real discussion of um, undermining privacy, no real discussion of influencing perspectives on things. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, that, that sort of come, you know, since we, since we published the books, but, um, you know, government, when it comes to cybersecurity has largely been laissez-faire. And, and so we're really looking at, uh, you know, the corporations, the vendors, you know, Microsoft, Zoom in this case, to sort of protect our cybersecurity and government has largely stayed away from that. Um, I mean, what's interesting you saw, you know, with uh, the ordering of the closure of the Chinese consulate in Houston, I thought it was a pretty creative um, uh, solution, you know, as a way to, to express displeasure with China, you know, over intellectual property theft and some other, right, some other things going on um, and, and pretty creative, but government is largely, you know, I, I would say doesn't quite, doesn't quite have the tools. Um, you know, it, it's, the US government is overdeveloped in the military sphere um, and, and very much underdeveloped in these other places. Um, but you know, at the same time, you know, we could probably see more, um, you know, private sector solutions, you know, in these, and, and then pull government in where it, where it needs to go. But again, easier said than done. I I I, I refrain from saying you know the importance of public private partnership, though it is, it's hard to do. I refrain from saying whole of government. It is, it's hard to do. Um, each government department has different authorities, different budgets, different constituencies in Congress. Um, so all those things are really hard. I mean, if they if they weren't, I mean, they probably wouldn't be problems um, is, is for us to talk about, so. Thank you. Our next question is going to come, uh, it's gonna be a mix of my own question as well as uh, Tim Malley, who uh, answered in the, in the chat a few times. 
Uh, how would we look at human security and national security in terms of uh, you know, the domestic protests and America's COVID response? And how would we think about what foreign powers might be thinking about it as well? Yeah, no, great, great question. And, and again, I'll admit, I don't, I'll have to look at, you know, we have a chapter in the book called Identity Security. And as I try to make sense of, um, you know, the, the uh, civil protests in the United States and, and efforts to address institutionalized racism, um, the, the identity security chapter works. I can't remember whether we, we addressed it in the US context. Um, and again, this is, this is, I think, some of the flaws in national security thinking is we tend to see these are problems, right, in developing countries. These are not problems in the United States. But, you know, what we were really looking for were new ways to think about what we were observing in the world. Um, and um, and if, you, if you read the classic Thomas Kuhn about paradigms, it's hard to shift paradigms. We offer a different paradigm. But I would probably look at, you know, Black Lives um, Matter through the, the paradigm of the identity security chapter that we offered. I can't, like I said, I can't remember whether we did that or not, but, but that's, where, that, that's where I would go to, to, to sort of think about these questions. Um, because, you, you know, again, you start looking at, it's a sense of belonging and what are, um, you know, institutionalized and cultural barriers to being inclusive. Um, and, um, you know, we, Kathleen and I sort of thought about this initially really in the context, you know, going back to, to Bosnia um, and Yugoslavia, uh, ethnic identity, um, we didn't think about it in the context of the United States. Of course, now we are and have been. And I think that that chapter would be sort of a useful way to, to sort of approach that. And, and Billy, if you can repeat on the international part, because that probably answered the first part, but I don't think I did justice to the second part of the question. Sure. Um, how would we think about foreign powers looking to U.S. domestic challenges and the uh, in terms of the way the U.S. might look at internal challenges elsewhere? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, the foreign powers are exploiting these divisions that exist, um, you know, within the United States. And, and again, you know, in the spirit of nothing is new, um, it's not new. I mean, the Soviets did it, you know, they, they exploited, um, um, you know, the civil rights marches that were occurring in the 60s and, and propagandized that. Um, even on health security, there was uh, somebody recently released a report on, um, you know, how the Soviets planted a conspiracy that the U.S. invented HIV and, and you know, they did it in the low tech means, um, you know, of, of spreading the conspiracy. But I think foreign powers are exploiting the division. I mean, one of the things, too, I think, you know, um, you know, thinking a lot about biases and the biases that we have and bring is, um, you know, the U.S. tends to, when it looks at a foreign power, um, you know, I think our, 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 our verbs, action verbs tend to be, you know, if it's a, a potential adversary, you know, deter, um, you know, dissuade, don't do something, deter, don't try it, you know, or defeat. Um, and, and I think we tend to hold that onto ourselves. Um, but I think in the case of sort of Russia or China, um, you know, it's, it's not to defeat the United States, it's to weaken um, the United States. And so, exploiting existing problems in the United States and enhancing those problems um, is a way to weaken the United States. Uh, and, and you've really seen that since the beginning of the Trump administration because it started sort of under the cloud of Russian election inter interference. And if it did nothing more, it created a distrust between the administration and the intelligence community. Russia wins, you know, in, in that situation. Um, and, uh, and, and so again, that's sort of unfortunate uh, but yeah, foreign powers will do this. The modern media environment, um, you know, make it easier um, to do this. Uh, and you're starting to see it goes back to who's responsible. So maybe that's an important question, you know, for everybody on here, like who's, who's responsible for human security? And at least in sort of the information cyberspace, um, you're starting to see, you know, Twitter, for example, banned, um, you know, a bunch of uh, uh, the uh, QAnon um, uh, accounts in the last couple of days. Um, Facebook has been going after what it calls inauthentic posts. So if, if a post is what appears, you know, is presented as an NGO sitting in New York, but it turns out it's a Russian intelligence backed um, group in Nigeria, um, Facebook will ban that, not because of the content, but because it's inauthentic. Um, and in there, so companies are starting to get a little more savvy on this, on the tech side, they're, they're catching up. I mean, it's been four years since the, the uh, um, you know, Russian hacking of the Democratic National uh, Committee headquarters and, and sort of spreading out 
um, you know, through various websites. And uh, so, you know, they're starting to kind of get serious, a little more serious about this. And, and government is sort of kicked in with some new structures and institutions and, and just raising the profile in Congress, holding more hearings. Um, but it's, again, it's sort of fighting the existing paradigm of the government sort of leaves the IT industry alone. And, and that's been a change, I think. And in the IT industry, um, you know, has been responding internally with limited success. I mean, you, you look at sort of Facebook has been struggling with how it's dealing with Black Lives Matter. Okay, I think we have time for uh, one more question. We will uh, bring it back to the pandemic with Adiat Abiodun asking, um, what is responsible for the lack of collective response to the COVID-19 pandemic in spite of its common threats to people in all states of the world? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, from, from the start, I mean, there's sort of the both sort of the informational side, um, you know, limited access to information, um, um, you know, on the, on the China front glo globally. Um, and, and you can kind of, you know, if you just sort of walk through your, your you know, recent memory, you know, it, it was really a, a, a big problem in, in Italy and then Spain. Um, and then it's only really probably within the last, I don't know, six, eight weeks where the U.S., uh, same thing with Brazil, you know, where, where it kind of accelerates. Um, and, and some of those initial points, I mean, it would be great, great to go back and, and look at, uh, you know, that, that cruise ship that was trying to get into Japan forever. Um, you know, that, that seemed like that was a nice small problem to have, um, you know, rather than the, the mass infection and thousands dying um, a day. But the... Um, you know, it's hard, you know, some of it again is where to govern, where does government put its attention, I guess is probably the first, you know, the first thing. And, and clearly it wasn't on, on public health. Um, and uh, certainly in the United States, I'm not quite sure where you are, uh, but, you know, we, we've had a, right, but done more as a political issue. You know, the question of universal health care, Obamacare, you know, the un, undoing that, you know, was, you know, a key piece, I think, of this administration, um, fighting Obamacare. Um, you know, at the same time, I wouldn't let the, um, um, you know, the uh, health sector off the hook either, you know, in terms of, you know, they would look at stocks of uh, personal protective equipment as, as sort of unproductive capital. And so they kept their stocks pretty low. And so all of a sudden, when you needed a lot of that PPE, it wasn't around because it was inefficient right before that. They, you know, the, the application of um, economic principles to healthcare. I think had a negative impact on, on the COVID response and, and certainly something to say about that. Um, lack of trust and in information sharing, right, exists. You, you know, you can go back to, um, you know, how the Chinese government was able to um, probably, I don't know what word you like, I'll, I'll, these are my personal views. So control the narrative of the World Health Organization that who lost global credibility because it was relying on sort of Chinese data and Chinese uh, thinking uh, on this. And, and we can't discount that either. Um, I'm not right, incredibly happy with the US response of just abandoning who I think the, the answer is not to abandon international institutions that, that the US has been a part of and, and key member for decades. I don't think that's the answer, but um, I, I think that has something to blame you know, as well. So I, you know, I would look at, right, it's a, it's a complete failure. And, and you know, by, by definition, um, you know, there, there's probably no easy way to sort of prevent it, but I would at least sort of look at, you know, across the board from, you know, the economics of healthcare to the lack of information flow, but also um, uh, undermining trust in international institutions uh, would be a, a key dimension. Uh, and, and that's sort of hard to kind of capture all that because, right, there's a larger, um, you know, anti-Trump um, narrative that exists. And so it's hard to sort of look at all of these other factors and see, well, if it were, um, you know, President Clinton, how, how would the COVID crisis been handled differently? You know, you can't quite do that, but at least try to look at the totality of, of where all those breakdowns occurred at the same time. Thank you, Doug. I mean, I think that uh, is a great way to, to close out this, uh, this session and uh, really, uh, again, that uh, choices that are made, mindsets matter. You know, uh, it's not accidental that if our mindset is that of great power competition, that when you are faced with something like this and, and your thinking might be 
uh, I'll be damaged, but someone else will be damaged more. And therefore, you know, if you see everything through the lens of competition, it has an impact so that, you know, not only who's in place, uh, the fact that most G20 governments in the world at this point either have openly populist or semi-populist leaders in place, as opposed to, again, to internationalists. If you look at who was in charge of the G20 uh, countries 10 years ago, it might have led to a different type of response. So elections matter, narratives matter. Uh, and so this was a great contribution uh, to this discussion that we've been having. I'd like to thank everyone uh, who has been watching and contributing. Uh, these are issues that uh, the US Global Engagement Program uh, will continue to be looking at, as well as other programs at the uh, Carnegie Council. Uh, again, uh, if you uh, have the opportunity, uh, feel free to visit, uh, to uh, as we linked at the beginning, to uh, uh, Derek's chapter. There's also a link to uh, Derek's publication page uh, for if you're interested in some of these issues and following through further. Uh, and with that, we are at the uh, top of the hour. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, we'll call this uh, session to a close. So thank you all very much for your attention and your participation, and especially thanks to Derek. Oh, thank, thank you, Nick, and the Carnegie Council and all these great questions.